transforms, it lifts the humble, rebukes the proud, protects the poor. Your word discerns the mind and spirit of all. Your word endures forever. Your word endures forever. Good morning and welcome to our service of morning worship this morning. Really good to have you with us. Uh, my name's Phil, but most of you will probably know that. But if you don't, if this is your first time uh, watching, then a warm welcome to you. Uh, we are three churches tucked in southeast Derbyshire between Nottingham and Derby. Uh, we're a benefice of Stanton by Dale with Dale Abbey and Risley. And it's really good to have you with us. We are passionate about knowing Jesus and making him known through all that we do. So yeah, if this is your first time watching, then it's really good to have you with us. A good morning as well to those, well actually, might be afternoon or evening, or just let's go for a hello to those who are watching on YouTube uh, later today. It's great that we've got that uh, connectivity as well. And there's a few people who've posted comments, well lots of people actually posted comments down the side, so we'll say good morning to you. And I'm pleased to say that I think for the first time Holly and Lucy are the first people to pop up a message, um, closely followed by Ian Clayton. So good morning uh, to you guys. Uh, yep, yeah, well done this morning. Good morning too to Roger and Sonia and to Isabel and Tom. Uh, Isabel and Tom are family friends who live up in Kirkintillock in Scotland. Good morning too to Robin and Merrill, much more local in Stanton by Dale. Uh, and good morning to Terry and Freddie and James. To Jackson. Jackson, you were just pit this morning, weren't you, by your mum? But great to have you with us, Jackson. Uh, good morning to Ralph and Sylvia and to Jeff as well. Good morning to Nancy and Tom. And good morning to the Holwell family and to Tina. Tina, glad to hear the sun shining in Risley. That's brilliant. Uh, and uh, Mo and Alan will be seeing that sunshine as well. Good to have you with us, Mo and Alan. Good morning to uh, Pauline Bales and to Glyn and Elaine and to Chris as well. Good morning, Chris. Good morning, Mary. Uh, up on the top of the hill there. Good to have you with us, Mary. And uh, Carol and Tony. This is great, isn't it? Because we've got names from all three of our churches mixing together at this uh, online service, showing that we're really we are one church family. Brilliant. So, Carol and Tony, good morning to you. Good morning to uh, Zoe and to Sydney, and to uh, Dave and Anne Cousins. There we go. Perfect. They put church family. That's brilliant, isn't it? Uh, good morning, Dave and Anne. Good morning to uh, to John and to Rachel, and to Win. That's brilliant. Now, Wynn is someone who's using the phone line. There's, there was details of that on the notices. Uh, that's a phone line for anyone who hasn't got internet access. They can phone up and hear uh, different elements of the service. I need to update it uh, for this week's thing, but it's a really useful service. And good morning to, to the Down family. Whew. Well, there may well be some more uh, that come up through the service, but you're all really welcome. And it's great to know that you are not the only one sitting either behind a computer or phone screen or TV. But actually, we're together um, meeting in the name of Jesus, separated by distance, but united by our faith. Just sneaking in there. Good morning to Nick and Ali Jackson as well. We'll do some more hellos uh, in a few moments. We'll just have uh, a moment of quiet and pause and then we'll say this opening prayer together. Let's just have a moment to catch our breath and to pause and remember who it is we're going to be talking to. And through the service, the responses will be in the yellow text that, that pops up on your screen. So grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And let's say this prayer uh, together. 
Lord, direct our thoughts and teach us to pray. Lift up our hearts to worship you in spirit and in truth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. It's a great prayer. And we would be led uh, by God's Spirit to worship him for the whole of our lives. That's what we want to do, isn't it? Now, let me get back to the right page. Uh, each week, we have been producing resources for our children uh, who are part of our kind of remote jam club. Normally, each Sunday, we want to be family friendly in everything that we do. Um, and so we normally have jam club where the, the children will go out to do different activities for part of the service. We haven't been able to do that since lockdown, but we have been able to produce uh, resources that have been shared each week. And here is this week's update. Um, the children have been learning. We started a new series in the book of Daniel. Remember last week we had that kind of, can you guess where the Bible story is from? That was brilliant. And this week I'm going to share uh, a resource from Sonia, who's uh, put together this week's teaching resources. This is a slightly abridged version, but the children have got the full version on the WhatsApp group. If you're not part of the WhatsApp group and you've got children and would like to be, then please do get in touch and would really happily add you to it. So, uh, by the way as well, before we look into this, um, grown-ups, in a bit when we look at Psalm 11, we're going to be focusing on how we need to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. And Daniel is a great example of how he does this uh, with the challenges that he faced. So, here is this week's Jam Club update. Hello everyone, I hope you've had a good week in spite of all this rain and wind. This week we're going to find out a little more about Daniel. If you look in your Bibles for the book of Daniel chapter 2 you'll be able to read this story. Well Barnaby's here again, I wonder if you can guess what he thinks he is. Yes, a king. Well, today we're going to hear about a king, not King Barnaby, but a king called King Nebuchadnezzar. He was king over the whole kingdom of Babylon, but he had a very troubled mind. He couldn't sleep. And when he did, he had a dream. And when he woke up, he was still very troubled. He couldn't understand his dream. He called for some men from his kingdom, who were supposed to be wise, to try and explain his dream, but they found it too hard. He was angry and he threatened to have these men killed. Daniel and his friends were also in danger, but Daniel spoke wisely and carefully to the commander of the guard and said he would explain the dream to the king. Daniel and his friends prayed to God to ask for his help and in the night God showed Daniel what the mystery was all about. I'm going to read you a few verses from Daniel chapter 2. May God be praised forever and ever. He is wise and powerful. He changes times and seasons. He removes some kings from power. He causes other kings to rule. The wisdom of those who are wise comes from him. He gives knowledge to those who have understanding. He explains deep and hidden things. He knows what happens in the darkest places and where he is, everything is light. God of my people of long ago, I thank and praise you. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we ask you for. You have shown us the king's dream. 
and that is what happened. We're now going to say a prayer. Dear God, thank you for the story of Daniel who trusted you and your promises even in difficult times. Give us the faith to trust in you. Help us to listen to you and recognise when you are speaking to us. Help us to dream big dreams of how the world could be. Thank you for our friends that support us and pray for us like Daniel's friends did. And we pray for the world that they would trust you to bring them through these difficult times. Amen. Now I'm going to send you lots of activities to do and here's some of them. I expect you will be able to do, I like this one, it says by helping each other with your troubles, you truly obey the law of Christ. And that's from Galatians 6, verse 2. And this one is a puzzle sheet. Lots of different things to do. But I also found a statue, a picture of a statue, actually. This is what it may have looked like. It tells you what each part of the statue was made from. The bottom part, the feet, was the bit that was made of iron and baked clay, and those broke quite easily. And here I have coloured mine in. You could colour it in, similar to this, or you might find some gold paper or silver paper and be able to make a statue of your own. Another idea is you could make a statue out of uh, Lego. Four different colours, perhaps, and you could get a small ball or a rolled up piece of paper and you could try and knock your statue down. I think if you're going to use a ball, probably outside is the best place. Anyway, I look forward to seeing what you've done and I'll see you again soon. Bye for now. Bye. Brilliant. Thank you, Sonia, for that. Uh, this absolutely fascinating uh, chapter, Daniel chapter 2. So uh, do give it a read, uh, grown-ups alike. And uh, next week, I'll try and show you some of the fruit of the, the children's work over recent weeks. Um, but grown-ups as well. If you want to make uh, a model of the uh, statue and see if you can uh, knock it down and, and destroy it, send me in some videos and I'll try and share those next week as well. Now, I need a little bit of help. Here is the bear, but I'm afraid I've run out of creative ideas of where to hide the bear after all these weeks of lockdown. Um, so if you've got an idea uh, where we could hide the bear um, in coming weeks live stream services, let me know or, or put it on the WhatsApp group uh, for Jam Club. That'd be brilliant. Great. OK, so what we're going to do now is we're going to come before our Heavenly Father our powerful God who answered Daniel's prayer, the revealer of mysteries, and we're going to confess our sins before him. Confess how we fall short of, of his standards and we need his grace and his mercy and forgiveness to wash over us and cleanse us of all of our sin. Now, uh, for this, the words again are, are on the screen. The responses are in yellow. Uh, each time after I say, Father, forgive us, um, if you could say, save us and help us so again a moment of quiet and then after this confession we're going to sing together god our father we come to you in sorrow for our sins for turning away from you and ignoring your will for our lives father forgive us save us and help us for behaving just as we wish, without thinking of you, Father forgive us, save us and help us. For failing you by what we do and think and say, Father forgive us, save us and help us. For letting ourselves be drawn away from you 
by temptations in the world about us. Father, forgive us, save us and help us. For living as if we were ashamed to belong to your Son, Father, forgive us, save us and help us. May the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image, to the praise and glory of his name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Blessed is the Lord, for he has heard the voice of our prayer. Therefore shall our hearts dance for joy, and in our song we will praise our God. Amen. Well, we're going to turn uh, to sing now. We're going to sing a song called Who Is This Man? Talking about Jesus being the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, who came to save us from sin, so that we might know that assurance and peace in our hearts of sins forgiven. This song is again uh, led by uh, uh, Emu Music, who we've used a few times over the recent months. So, um... It might be a new one to you, uh, but enjoy. We're going to sing, Who is this man? Hello, hello. We're going to sing a song about Jesus. Do you know who Jesus is? He's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the Son of God. And we're going to praise him as we sing this song together. He's the King of Kings. Just a little bit more. Some more room? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's great. Thanks. Shall we sing? One, two, three, four. It's a great song uh, that teaches us great truths about the Lord Jesus. Now there's a few more people to say hello to uh, this morning. Uh, good morning to Joan Stapleton and to Val and to Roy. Great to have you guys with us. Glad the technology's uh, working for that to happen. Uh, good morning to to ah to Esther, Joel, and Lydia, and to Ruth. Um, just in the other room in the same house, uh, and to my mother-in-law and uh, to John as well. Uh, good morning to uh, Lorraine Curtis. Good to have you with us, Lorraine. And to Corinne and Adrian. 
and uh, to oh yeah that's it Corinne and Adrian good to have you with us and Tina's said how nice it is to see Sonia I know cause, like lots of us haven't seen a lot of us for a long time have we uh, I've had <laughs> a helpful idea from my family that Teddy needs to parachute down hmm that's going to be uh, an interesting one to try and work out logistically anybody got a fishing rod uh, good morning to uh, Kelly Davis. Great to have you with us, Kelly, and your family. And no worries about being late. Also to the James family as well. Just great to have you with us. And the Sherwood family too. So, uh, we'll do some other notices uh, now while we're together. And um, I'm glad to be able to report that we're now in a position to reopen our buildings for, for public worship. really want to say a big thank you uh, to the wardens and to Elaine and the, the wider ministry team for their help and support and advice with this. It's been quite a, uh, a big project. Um, when we reopen our churches, things are going to look very different, uh, I'm afraid. We'll have to do uh, two metre social distancing in our churches, which does really reduce the capacity of our buildings. So, to enable us all to have the opportunity to come... Uh, the plan is to repeat the same service seven times across the benefits over the next uh, two and a half weeks or so, which should give everyone who is able and would like to the opportunity to come to one service um, before uh, we get to August. We're just asking for people to, to come to one so that there's a chance for others to come to the other services, if you know what I mean. Uh, so, this week... Let me get this right. On Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock, we'll have a service at Risley. And then on Sunday next week, we'll have a service at 9 o'clock at Dale Abbey. And at 4 o'clock at Stanton by Dale. And um, at half past 10 next Sunday, we'll be doing our usual live stream service. Because doing our live stream service will still enable us all to kind of be together corporately in a much bigger group. Uh, then... All, all these service details are on uh, the new sheet, which has come around via email. And, oh yeah, you've got it on the email as well. If you're not getting the church emails and would like to, um, please do let me know. Uh, so in the meantime, half past ten on a Sunday, we're still going to continue with our live stream services for the, all of the forthcoming weeks. So always be here, half ten on a Sunday. But do book in for one of the services uh, that we're going to have in the buildings if you're able to. I will make sure that one of those services is recorded and uploaded as well so that if you're shielding at home or unable to get out for whatever reason you'll still be able to access um, that service. Uh, because of the extra work and logistics of uh, starting this new service in our buildings there won't be a service of morning prayer uh, this week. Sorry for those of you who, who will miss that but um, just need to keep things manageable. And uh, one of the notice, can I ask for your prayers, please, for the PCC as we meet together online on uh, Tuesday night? So I think that's all the notices. Do, like I say, get in touch if you're not getting the emails or if you've got questions or concerns about any of this. Uh, and I, I must reiterate, please do book in for the services. There will be enough space for everyone. So don't think you're going to take someone else's space. And... Do uh, be prepared to come to one of the churches that may not be your normal one, if you know what I mean. Because we're, we're, st we're still one church. The services are going to look the same, whichever building you go to. Um, but know that you're welcome and we'll do all that we can uh, to make it safe and a, a good time to be together. Um, right, <laughs> some more ideas coming up on the side. I'm not going to look at them now because I'm going to get too distracted. So, uh, thank you for them though. I will make sure I look at them later. Those are the notices for today. Let's let's turn now to God's Word. So if you've got a Bible open, uh, a Bible with you, it's always a great uh, discipline to have God's Word in front of you so that you can see it and check where things are coming from. Uh, but Nick Jackson is going to bring us our Bible reading this morning from Psalm 11. Here we go. Good morning from a sunny Dale Abbey. Today we're looking at Psalm 11. 
which is headed in in the direct for the uh, is read is written by the director of music of David. In the Lord, I take refuge. How then can you say to me, flee like a bird to your mountains? For look, the wicked bend their bow bows. They set their arrows against the strings to shoot from the shadows at the upright in heart. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is the Lord of the holy temple. The Lord is the heavenly throne. He observes everyone on earth. His eyes examine them. The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked whose love, who loves violence, he hates them with a passion. On the wicked he will rain, fiery coals and burning sulphur. A scorching wind will be their lot. For the Lord is righteous. He loves justice. The upright will see his face. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Nick, for bringing us our Bible reading uh, this morning. We're hearing God speak to us through his word, and we're going to now spend time speaking to him in prayer. I'm going to lead us in saying the collect for today, and then I'm going to share some prayers uh, with you that Ali Jackson has kindly written for us. So let's turn now to pray. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is governed and sanctified, hear our prayer which we offer for all your faithful people, that in their vocation and ministry they may serve you in holiness and truth to the glory of your name, through our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So here's some prayers uh, from Ali for us this morning. And when I say, Lord, in your mercy, you could respond with, hear our prayer. And helpfully, uh, Ali begins by reading from the book of Daniel, which ties in nicely with our children's work. In the book of Daniel we read, How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders! His kingdom is an eternal kingdom, his dominion endures from generation to generation. And then later we also read, The Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth, and gives them to anyone he wishes, and sets over them the lowliest of people. These words are spoken by the pagan king Nebuchadnezzar and show how, Father, you can reveal yourself to anyone. Yet he refused to submit himself to you and let you be his king. And later we read how he was humbled by your powerful hand. In contrast, when Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego are asked to bow before the idol Nebuchadnezzar had set up, we read of their response. King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. So Lord, we want to acknowledge and praise you for your power, your might and your rule over us today and to declare that we want to trust you even now. Lord, what great truths these are to take to heart, as there is so much going on around us that would suggest that you are not in control, and yet we have the choice to bow the knee to you, and to trust in your rule over this earth. It's easy to want to take control of our lives, or live in fear that we have no control, when all you ask is that we trust in your faithfulness, to walk with us, to walk with you, through whatever situations we find ourselves in. Let's take a moment to recognise which areas of our lives we need particular help uh, to trust God this week. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, you have placed our government over us to rule in a way that enables us to live peaceful lives. And we recognise what hard decisions are having to be made at this time in response to COVID. 
We pray for those who advise them that the information would be accurate, timely, and the consequences of decisions would be clearly thought through, understood, and clearly communicated to the public, so that we would have confidence to follow guidance that issues are uh, being given for the benefit of all. Yet in the midst of this there is the fear that this infection is widening the gap between rich and poor, and this will have an effect on our society in ways we may not see or comprehend for years to come. Father, we are troubled this week about a report that's come out from the Children's Trust regarding the effect of lockdown on children, highlighting concerns about domestic abuse, mental health, including loneliness, educational loss, hunger and food insecurity, and the effect of a lack of access to outdoor space and other things it has on the well-being of children. Lord, our hearts break for the innocent children who have and are suffering in these ways. May support be available for all who need it, and restoration of the right services to come quickly. We pray for our outreach to children in this regard, including Jam Club, for those who would normally attend, see and know, for all sorts, and for all children we know who may be affected at this time. Lord, we pray that they will be in your hands and your... Uh, sorry, we pray, Father, that we would be your hands, words and love to them, that they too would know that you watch over them and love them. And we just take a moment now to bring before our Heavenly Father children we know, or maybe those we don't know personally, but who may be suffering at this time. We also recognise that there are many people in our world who do not have governments that can support those in need. And today we pray for those in the Philippines who live below the poverty line, and for many there who since lockdown have had no income, and so very little, if any, food on their tables. We pray today for Emmanuel International Philippines, a charity, a Christian charity partnering with churches in the informal settlements of squatters around the city dump in Quezon City. They've been distributing food packages. Father, thank you that these food packages are not only going to church members but also to their neighbours, demonstrating practically the message of hope and life and Jesus' gift of love. Again, we take a moment to lift these people and this expression and many others that we might know of, of God's love uh, to you and ask, Lord, that you uh, would be made known through these gestures. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I thank you, Lord, that things are easing with lockdown, and we are so glad that next week we'll be able to get back into our churches, even if things are different to normal. We thank you for the hard work of the ministry team here, especially Elaine and the wardens and the readers and those who oversee our safety in this regard. May all the arrangements work and as we meet together, may we have hearts of thanksgiving and be able to worship you and not to concentrate on the things that we're missing. Let us fix our eyes on you and worship you, asking you how you want us to live in this next phase of our lives. And Lord, we recognise too that some are no longer with us, not necessarily due to COVID, but for a whole variety of reasons. And we thank you for the life of Ian Gooding, a rector here for many years. And we pray for friends and family who mourn him and others that they've lost at this time. There are others known to us we miss and some who are struggling with ill health. We again pray that they would take strength from you and trust in your ways and the hope we have in Jesus. Lord, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we'll join together now by saying the Lord's Prayer. And just get the words up on the screen. There we go. So let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And before we look at at Psalm 11 in a bit more detail, we're going to affirm our faith in God, standing with countless generations of Christians and numerous Christians all around the world. Let's uh, encourage each other with these words. I believe in God, the Father, the Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Brilliant. Well, we're going to look at now a bit more detail in Psalm 11. So do uh, have your Bibles open in front of you, if you can. I've not managed to uh, like um, edit this sermon like I have done in recent weeks with all of the verses uh, popping, popping up on the screen but that's no bad thing because it's great to have a bible in front of you as we talk from God's word just going to make sure I record it as well here we go brilliant so as we come to God's word and look at Psalm 11 together uh, let's pray again I'm going to echo a prayer that we used in our morning prayer service uh, this week with some words from Psalm 19 Let's pray. May these words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, this morning, as I've mentioned, as we look at this psalm, Psalm 11, we're going to be challenged and encouraged about where we fix our eyes. In other words, where we place our trust when everything is stripped away and we have nothing else to rest upon, when we're in the middle of tough times, when our faith is being tested, when we might seem in a completely impossible situation, when all of our foundations seem to be swiped from under our feet and when our faith is really put to the test. David, the psalmist, is in that situation and at the start of this psalm he lays out his position really clearly. So have a look at the start of verse 1. David says this, In the Lord I take refuge. In the Lord I take refuge. David is really emphatic and clear about where he stands. But what was it that led to David being in the position where he has to make this proclamation about how the land lies for him so clearly? Well, we're going to look in verses 1b to 3 at the questions that are asked of David's faith. Okay, so we're going to look at verse 1b. Now, when I say uh, 1b, sometimes when you see Bible references, you'll have a little letter after the Bible reference. And that kind of just refers to how far down the the verse you're looking. Generally, it's only a, b, or sometimes c. So we're just looking at the second part of verse 1. And we see that David is being encouraged probably by friends which is the surprising thing and they may even be friends who have faith David is being encouraged by them to flee to the mountains how do we know that they're friends well we read in verse 2 how they describe the wicked they look on other people and call them the wicked so the people telling David to flee are not his adversaries themselves they are friends who are trying to advise him that in the desperate situation he finds himself, the most sensible thing, the safest thing that he could do is to flee. So have a look at verse 1b. How then can you say, 
Flee like a bird to your mountain. So this is their advice. Flee like a bird to your mountain. For look, the wicked bend their bows. They set their arrows against the strings to shoot from the shadows at the upright in heart. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? These friends, you know, are perhaps a bit like the friends that Job has in the book of Job are trying to offer advice to David. They can see that he's in a desperate situation with the wicked bending their bows in his direction with arrows coming in and his foundations being shaken. What should David do? Well, their advice is forget taking refuge in God. They think he should flee. He should run. They question whether his faith will be strong or powerful or sufficient enough to bring him through this trial because this is a real big one. Now, we may well get well-meaning people challenge us about our faith when, re when we are really up against it. And this can be dangerous because we might get really unwise counsel from those who really love us, who want the best for us. The danger can be subtle and kind of can come from those who are beside us. The most religious, perhaps well-intentioned counsel may lead us to, a li to living life via unbelief. So how can we tell wise advice and unfaithful advice apart? Well, we need that ability to discern what is best. And as a prayer I'm going to show you from Philippians uh, chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, which is really, really so helpful. Okay, the Apostle Paul prays this for the uh, Philippian Christians. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best, and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. He prays that their love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that they can know what is best. May that be our prayer, that as we grow in love, and knowledge that we will be better able to discern what is best. And that in turn will always lead us to take refuge in the Lord, as David is doing at the start of verse 1. But there's another thing to think through too, isn't there? The advice from David's friends assume that safety is the ultimate goal. Now, of course, self-preservation is important, isn't it? But when I assume it's all important, you know, the biggest thing that trumps everything else, well, there's a danger that we've made it an idol, isn't it? Am I doing that? Are we doing that? Perhaps when we think that, oh, I must retain the security of that job or that situation. We've probably kind of crossed the idolatry line when we think that we should take no risks. It is possible to make such an idol of security that you prize it more than God. Something interesting to think through. And that, that's where kind of thinking through what's most important to you, where you go back to when everything else is, is down the pan, is really important. May your love abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you are able to discern what is best and always rest with the Lord as your refuge whatever situation or trial you'll face whether that's a really tricky situation now or something further down the line in the future these are strong questions being asked of David's faith David's faith by his friends aren't they because he would be tempted uh, to be drawn away by his counselors but David excuse me ugh, but David, by God's grace, is secure. So look at the answers that David's faith gives him in verses 4 to 7. What does David remind himself of in these verses? Well, he reminds himself of the God in whom he's taken refuge. And what a great reminder this is. Look at verse 4. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. He observes everyone on earth. His eyes examine them. The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked, those who love violence, he hates with a passion. 
On the wicked he will rain fiery coals and burning sulphur. A scorching wind will be their lot. For the Lord is righteous. He loves justice. Now verse 4 is slap bang right in the middle of the psalm. And it teaches us loads about God. Far from God being a distant kind of ineffective deity in the clouds. Look at this wonderful description. He is in his holy temple. So the implication is God is holy. He, he's set apart. He's pure. He's just. Because of that, he's worthy of worship. Which is why he's in his holy temple. He is sovereign. Do you see that? He's sitting on the throne. So he's powerful. He's in control. He observes everyone on earth. And I was talking with Joel about this last week. And Joel was asking, how is that possible? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. But I do know that if God created the universe simply by speaking in all its vastness and complexity, just as we were thinking about a few weeks ago when we looked at Psalm 8, then it's not a hard thing for him to observe everyone on earth. If he has that power, is it? It's not a hard thing. And actually, if you flip it round the other way, it would be a much more frightening thought if God did not observe everyone on earth. Because where would our hope for justice be? And in these verses we learn loads about the character of God. We see the depth of his hate of sin. And his great love for his people. We see how passionately just God is. We see how God hates. So he will rain down raging retribution. We see that in verse 6. Yet Yahweh loves, in verse 7, he loves justice. Get the contrast. He hates sin. He loves justice. So one commentator talks of these verses like this. He says, all of this tells us that God is not a mere three-letter word. The God of the Bible is not a formless blob of celestial protoplasm. You can see I'm quoting someone else here because I'd never come up with something like that. He says this, Let the flaming passion of these words slither down the throat of your soul and see how different this virile biblical God is from the sentimental deity men imagine. There is nothing bland about Yahweh. Now Yahweh is the, the name translated where you see Lord in capital letters in your Bible. That's kind of God's covenant, special personal name. There's nothing bland about God. We see God's righteous character at the start of verse 7, don't we? And that explains why he judges justly in verses 5 and 6. And once more, since we've seen it in other Psalms, this justice is our only solid comfort and hope. If the righteous, as David is in this psalm, are to be delivered, then the wicked must be judged. And that will only happen if God is actively just. That's why uh, God's judgment is such good news for God's people. Because only when God comes and puts everything right will we fully and finally see justice. And friends, as New Testament believers, remember the Psalms are in the Old Testament. As New Testament believers, where do we see God's love and his justice most fully and finally displayed? Well, it's on the cross, isn't it? There we see God's hatred of sin and the full force of his judgment. As Jesus bears the full weight of our sin on himself, paying the price for all of our rebellion and sin. Now, just think, if you're not trusting Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, you will be facing the full force of God's hatred of sins yourself. Can I encourage you today, accept the gift of forgiveness that Jesus offers. Don't flee and try and run off and try to hide, as David was being encouraged to do. Come to Jesus as your refuge. God hates sin and it will be judged. But God's hatred of sin at the cross is not the only thing we see, is it? We see God's love in all its vastness displayed. As God takes on the punishment, our sins 
deserved on himself. There's this brilliant verse here from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Uh, it says this, He, that's Jesus himself, bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. What amazing love that that is, that God will take on our sins himself. Amazing. Now just before we move on, we must go back to verse 4. For it's here that David reveals the secret of steadfastness in this chaotic world. Right, and this is going to seem really, really simple. Okay? But everything depends on your vision. You can either look at the wicked, who are stringing their bows against you perhaps, or you can place your eyes on God who sits on his throne in verse 4. Despair is managed by keeping God himself at the centre of your vision. Just like Daniel did in chapter 2 where he prayed to God for the answer to his prayers, that the mystery would be revealed. Here we see in verse 4 that the Lord is in his holy temple, he's on his heavenly throne. And as Christians, the encouragement for us is to fix our eyes upon Jesus. And that is all that anchors you when your foundations turn to slime. And there's that brilliant hymn, isn't it? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. I was trying to find a way for us to be able to get to uh, to sing that this week, but uh, I've not been able to, to do that. But we will sing it in future weeks. It's a great encouragement. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. And this beautiful true story helps to ground uh, what that looks like. Okay, So there was a Christian missionary who had taken a Christian man who was a migrant from Egypt to an appointment with a doctor. Now this Egyptian Christian, okay, uh, this migrant, he had been in hospital six times in three months for liver failure and he was a candidate for liver transplant, uh, for a liver transplant. In answer to the doctor's questions at this particular appointment, the Egyptian brother replied, Jesus here, everything okay? Pointing to his heart, he said, Jesus here, everything okay? He was simply saying that there is something basic that controls the outlook on everything else in his life. And that was the fact that he got Jesus in his heart. That is a great example of what it means to have, your, uh, to have Jesus as your refuge, to fix your eyes upon him. So we've seen how David's faith has been questioned, haven't we? And we've seen how his faith has provided clear answers, especially because of verse 4. And then just as we come to the end, we see the hope of David's faith. Look at verse 7c, the end of verse 7. The upright will see his face. Now we can't leave this psalm without looking at this. The upright will see his face. That's talking about seeing God's face. Now, uh, Derek Kidner, he's another commentator who's written a lot about the psalms. He puts it like this. If the first line of the psalm showed where the believer's safety lies, you know, taking refuge in God, the last line shows where his heart should be. Genuine disciples don't just want uh, protection from God, but want communion with him, a relationship with him. And seeing his face is a great example of that. And what a hope that is for us too. Peter uh, catches our position in his striking description of Christians in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8. I haven't got this verse to show you, but he says this. Though you've not seen him, you love him. Psalm 11 teaches us to keep our eyes fixed upon Jesus. It says we need to filter out unwise counsel. And have faith to see the just and reigning God on his throne, who we know and love as the Lord Jesus. And this psalm teaches us, doesn't it, of how our faith gives us the hope of one day fully and finally gazing on his face. And all of this uh, proves a real help, especially when things fall apart. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for this psalm and for what it teaches us. Please help us to fix our eyes upon you and your Son, our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, for each of us, 
please help us so that our love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that we may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, I hope that was helpful uh, for you this morning. We're going to sing now to draw our service to a close. We're going to sing, Guide me, O thou great Redeemer. As we fix our eyes upon Jesus, let him be our guide. Let's sing. Here we go. Well, it's been great to have you with us uh, this morning. Just say a quick hello to uh, Vaz. Vaz, uh, great to have you with us as well this morning. I um, hope this has been a help and encouragement to you. And I hope too to be able to see some of you at Risley at 7 o'clock on Wednesday night or at 9 o'clock at Dale Abbey next Sunday morning. And then again, half past 10 with our live stream next Sunday here via Facebook and YouTube. And then 4 o'clock at Stanton. There are still spaces at all of those services so don't don't be shy do uh, drop me or Elaine an email and we'll happily uh, book you in to the different services over the next couple of weeks as well as continuing with our live stream. Let's uh, close our time together formally uh, with a word of prayer. 
Dear Heavenly Father, please may you be our refuge and may we long for that day when we can see your face. We are so grateful, Lord, for all your love and goodness to us. Thank you for the justice that you will bring and thank you for providing the Lord Jesus to deal with our sin. May we keep our eyes firmly fixed on him and may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be amongst us and remain with us always. Amen.